Hello, I'm Infamous Fear. What's that? It's time for Infamous Queer! Pride, 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 darling, darling, pride, pride, 95! Ah, the 1950s. The post-war period was a turbulent time. While on the surface, the 1950s was a shining, perfect time where morals were valued, men worked, women made themselves nice for their husbands, and children were rosy-cheeked and apple-pied, Beneath that shiny exterior lurked a distinct feeling of menace. The threatening spectre of the Cold War loomed. People were afraid. Of what? Of communists, gay people, black people, Asians, of their own shadows. And above all else, they were afraid of teenagers. The concept of the teenager as a separate stage of one's life was only fairly recent. People were taking longer to enter the workforce full-time and were getting married later, leading to their adolescence being recognised as a distinct period. The widespread availability of the car also led to greater independence for teenagers, which of course meant that they could drive into an open field and start fucking, only to be interrupted by some kind of slasher movie villain. Or, more likely, they could get into one of those drag races which seemed to be just about the only thing anyone ever did in the 1950s. But anyway, we had teenagers and we had cars. What was the next step? Well, teens in movies, of course. The rise of drive-in movie theatres meant that teens were an even bigger market for movies than they were before, resulting in people creating movies specifically for and about teenagers. And now, after that long preamble, let's get down to talking about one of the most famous teen movies of all. You're probably wondering why I'm talking about teen movies from the 1950s. After all, isn't this infamous queer? Wasn't the 1950s a wholesome time where no one was allowed to be gay, like, ever? Well, apart from this guy, that is. What Jimmy didn't know was that Ralph was sick. A sickness that was not visible like smallpox, but no less dangerous and contagious. A sickness of the mind. You see, Ralph was a homosexual. But don't you worry, I may be talking about a teen movie from the 1950s, but it's a gay movie as well. Everyone, zip up your red windbreak and run out the door to the nearest police station. This is Rebel Without a Cause. How can I feel pain? How can I feel pain when you're being so supportive? Ah yes, Rebel Without a Cause. Let me count the gays. Directed by a bisexual man, starring a possibly gay or bisexual man, also starring a gay man. Also, the plot is pretty gay too. All joking aside, this movie is frequently classified as an LGBT-themed movie with at least one coded gay character. But how is this homosexuality portrayed? Is it the source of these rebellious teens' misery? Or is it a disguised aspect of the story added in by a queer director and his queer stars which appealed to a different sort of teenager than the ones most parents were thinking of? Well, there's nothing to do except find out. The film starts off in a police station, with our three main characters, Jim, Judy and Plato, being brought in, all in various states of distress and drunkenness. Jim has been out drinking in order to distract himself from his unstable home life. Judy tried to run away from home, but what about the innocent, cherubic Plato? Do you have any idea why you shot those puppies, John? Well, that's fucking dark. The next day, Jim goes to his new school, but despite being played by the attractive, charismatic James Dean, he seems to have trouble fitting in. It isn't long before he is ridiculed for disrupting a field trip to the observatory, and is threatened by a gang of knife-wielding bullies, who goad him into taking up their challenge of dangerous automotive hijinks. Well, it's either that or being called a chicken, and, as we all know, chickens are the most cowardly animals of all. Despite the fact that the males of the species routinely engage in their own equivalent of violent knife fights. Is that meaning me? Is that meaning me? What? A chicken! Yes. You shouldn't call me that. That night, Jim goes to take part in a chicken race against the leader of the thugs, Buzz, Judy's boyfriend. However, the race goes awry and Buzz ends up driving over a cliff to his death. <laughs> Where's Buzz? Down there. Let's get out of here. Jim tries to explain to his family what happened, but they aren't prepared to listen. You don't want me to go? No! No, I don't want you to go to the police! There were other people. Why should you be the only one involved? But I am involved. We are all involved. 
Mom, a boy, a kid was killed tonight. I don't see how I can get out of that by pretending that it didn't happen. Well, you know that you did the wrong thing. That's the main thing, isn't That's it? That's nothing. That's... That is absolutely nothing. Dad, you told me. You said you, you want me to tell the truth. Now, didn't you say that? He tries to go to the police, but is prevented from doing so by the thugs, who swear their vengeance upon him. Jim and Judy run away to an abandoned mansion Plato told them about and find Plato there. The three grow close, with both Judy and Plato clearly having romantic feelings towards Jim, who clearly cares about both of them. However, this ideal is shattered when the thugs find the house and break in, only for one of them to be shot by the nervous histrionic Plato with his mother's gun. The police arrive, only for Plato to shoot at them. He then runs away and hides in the observatory. Judy and Jim follow him, and Jim tries to placate and disarm him. Hey, not gonna have the, have the gun, Plato? You wanna give it to me? My gun? Yeah, in your pocket. Give it to me. No, I need it. Uh, don't you trust me, Plato? Just give it to me for a second. Uh, now there's a lot of people out front. Plato, Plato, you promised to give it back. Friends always keep their promises. The police find them, and in the resulting standoff, the alarmed Plato draws his gun on the police, who fatally shoot him. The distraught Jim reconciles with his family and is comforted by both Judy and his now confident protective father. Man, teenagers in the 50s sure got up to a lot of stuff. God knows when I was a teenager, I didn't do anything. So, on a first glance, this seems like a natural evolution of the basic rebellious teen plot, a genre that took off with the success of Blackboard Jungle, a rock and roll fueled movie about a teacher struggling with problems, students and delinquency, that incited riots in its audience. But there's more to Rebel Without a Cause. The film presents a theory about why teenagers rebel and why young people are troubled, and the theory about delinquency and social instability is more than a little related to sexuality. I said... It was a matter of honor. Remember? But they called me chicken. You know? Chicken. It's easy enough to think that Jim, the main character, is the rebel without a cause. But the one with the most tragic existence, the one whose life is the most unstable and who is the greatest outcast, is no other than Salmoneo's character, Plato. Despite instruction from the production code officer at the time to not in any way imply a queer relationship between Plato and Jim on screen, Plato is near unambiguously a gay character who quite clearly expresses his interest in attraction to Jim. Hey, you want to come home with me? I mean, there's nobody home at my house. Heck, I'm not tired. Are you? See, I don't have too many people I can talk to. Who asked? If you want to come... We could talk and in the morning we could have breakfast like my dad used to. Really? That's about as subtle as when I did it. So, you want to come back to my place? Plato's crush on Jim was more than a little informed by Sal Maneo's real-life romantic interest in James Dean, a man who is commonly thought to have been queer himself. Maneo's portrayal wasn't stereotypical, either in a flippant camp way or a villainous way, but was a sensitive reflection of the realities of being a gay teen. Sadly, his character's interest in Jim doesn't end too well for him, not because Jim is in any way upset by his attraction, but because Plato, as a gay character, is portrayed as being beyond help. He's the most troubled of the three teens. Not only is his initial crime the most psychopathic and difficult to contemplate, the lonely Plato has a kind of psychotic break at the end of the film, suffering from a hysterical panic and attacking not only his aggressor, but Jim too. His idolising of Jim is portrayed as somewhat pathetic and juvenile, manifesting itself in his desire to wear Jim's clothes and to look up to him as a father figure, as the protector he never had. Chief, only you could have been my dad. <laughs> you flipped or something. But not even Jim can save him at the end. Why did you run out of me? Why did you, Why did you leave me alone? Hey. I thought you were someone else. 
Who? Who? Plato, it's me. Look at me. What's the matter with you, anyway? Huh? Go! Get out, my father! Plato is such a troubled person that he has no hope of resuming the safety of normal societal values as the others do, and so he must die in order to show the others what they risk by trying to pursue the life of a societal outcast. And this brings us to another theme. We're presented with two opposing ways of life in the movie. The troubled life of a delinquent who fights, drinks and risks death, and the stability of the heterosexual family, an ideal that is held as the very structure of a functioning society itself. All of our characters are troubled because they don't have this fundamental stability in their life. Jim rebels because the balance of power is uneven between his mother and father. Well, you say one thing, he says another, and everybody changes back again! That's a fine way to behave! Well, you know who he takes after. His father is emasculated and meek, and frequently acquiesces to the demands of Jim's mother. And Jim's mother is shrewish and argumentative and domineering. Well... Hi, Jimbo. You thought I was mom? Jim looks to his father for guidance, but doesn't receive it. What can you do when you have to be a man? Well, uh, now... No, you give me a direct answer. Jim feels anxious about his own masculinity, and his continual attempts to prove that he's enough of a man are the main reason for his rebellion. You had a good start in the wrong direction back there. Why'd you do it? What do you mean? Mess a kid up? Yeah. Called me chicken. And your folks didn't understand? They never do. Why do we do this? You gotta do something. He begs his father to be more of a man, to stand up for himself, and to be a stronger patriarch who Jim can rely on and look up to, instead of continually moving town and running away from his problems. Judy's relationship with her father is coloured by an uneasy hint of sexuality. He called me a dirty tramp. My own father. Either Judy's father is afraid of his daughter's developing womanhood and what that means for a society that is both obsessed with the female body and repelled by female sexuality, or Judy's father has been sexually abusing her and wants to hide it from his wife. In either case, there's an uncomfortable Freudian edge to their interactions. I guess I just don't understand anything. I'm tired. I'd like to change the subject. Why? I'd just like to, that's all. Girls your age don't do things like that. You need an explanation? Plato, on the other hand, doesn't seem to have a father at all, nor any guidance from a doting mother. For once, his homosexuality is not blamed on an overprotective mother, for Plato's mother doesn't seem to care about him, and he's instead looked after by the housekeeper a woman who cares very much about this sensitive boy, but can't be a proper parent to him. Plato doesn't have a stable family at all, and this is why he is the most unhinged and the most beyond hope. In the end, Jim restores the balance in the world by entering into an ideal heterosexual relationship with Judy, as well as resolving the tension between his mother and his father, allowing his father to be a strong patriarch once more, while providing Judy with some masculine stability in her life. Plato, the obvious aberration to this ideal of heterosexual normalcy, has no redemption and must die, so that Jim and Judy can live a normal heteronormative life. You know what he wanted? What? He tried to make us his family. Heterosexuality and the stable traditional family fixes all societal ills, whether homosexuality or depression or possible trauma from childhood sexual abuse. Hmm, where have I heard that before? Yes, that's right. The ideal as presented in Rebel Without a Cause is dangerously close to the ideal presented in Alfie's home. Speaking of Alfie's home, while heterosexual stability abounded in the film's moral, there was rather less of it on the film set than you'd think. Despite the fact that the director, Nicholas Ray, apparently wanted to treat the cast as family, he had a slightly dubious relationship with his stars, apparently seducing at least two, if not three of them. Seeing as both Salmoneo and Natalie Ward were only 16 at the time, that's more than a little predatory. Ray's own home life had been troubled, in a way even more dubious than the three households portrayed here. He divorced his second wife after finding her in bed with his 13-year-old son. The boy in question later went on to marry his previous stepmother. This isn't entirely irrelevant to the nature of the film. Nicholas Ray's assistant and lover, writer Gavin Lambert, said that 
Part of Rebel was Nick's own guilt of being a bad and neglectful father. Ray even tries to insert himself into the film as a father figure, as the caring police detective sharing his name. But when shit gets real for Jim's character, Ray, the supporting cop, is nowhere to be found. Possibly reflecting the director's own absence from the lives of his children, something which he tried to compensate for by surrounding himself with a young cast, several of whom he tried to be both a father figure to, and a lover as well. Man, the 50s were more twisted than I thought. Not only did Rebel Without a Cause have a strange and troubled air behind the set, in the lives of the actors and of the director himself, the film itself is troubled and considered to be somewhat cursed. James Dean, Natalie Wood and Salman Ayo all went on to die rather early. James Dean died first in a car crash before the film was released. Do you have any special advice for the young people who drive? Take it easy driving. The life you might save might be mine. You know? <laughs> Natalie Ward drowned while in her 40s, and Salman Ayo was murdered in an alleyway at 37. But apart from being glorious 50s ideal of family life, shoehorned into a film about violent and troubled youth, Rebel Without a Cause is also interesting as a work of cinema itself. For one thing, the narrative framework is frenetic and more than a little odd. It might escape the viewer who was drawn into the story itself, but the time frame of the story is ludicrous. The film takes place over a mere 24 hours, meaning that not only do Plato and Judy fall head over heels for Jim in one day, but it also only takes one day for Jim to become directly or indirectly involved in no less than three people's deaths. I'd almost forgive the rapidity of Plato and Judy's feelings for Jim, because, well, it's James Dean, but the pace of the story is astoundingly unrealistic and exaggerated. Setting a film in one day makes sense if it, say, revolves around a dog day afternoon style hostage crisis, or if it's a more subdued work, like A Single Man or The Breakfast Club, where the stakes are just as high, but the characters realistically do a lot less with their one day. Everything in this movie is accelerated, and if you think about it too long, it makes incredibly little sense. If I were going to pair this movie with another, the lighter, sunnier, but no less unrealistic side of this frenetic 24-hour paced coin would be the similarly classic four-word titled teen movie, Ferris Bueller's Day Off. In both movies, an incredibly charismatic, charming teenage man takes a female and male friend out to a place or places where they can learn to feel confidence in themselves. But where Jim finds his way into situations because he's rebellious and troubled, Ferris finds his way into situations because he's charismatic and he's always got a way to make his criminality work for him. Cameron, like Plato, is the one who is the true outcast and is the one who bears the brunt of the main character's decisions. At the end of the movie, it's he who will be punished, whether by death or by death. I don't care, I really don't. I'm just tired of being afraid. In both cases, they value the friendship of the main character so much that they'll risk even that. So what movie says more about the teen experience? Well, in both cases, neither movie has a completely positive message. In Rebel Without a Cause, frustrated teenagers are allowed the chance to be frustrated, but the solution to their problems is the simplicity of gendered, heteronormative 1950s patriarchy. In Ferris Bueller's Day Off, problems are solved by bullshitting and running away, and those who try and live life in a mature and responsible manner are the ones who end up being punished. Both movies grasp at something that teens identify with, and both represent something of the way that teenagers often act and feel, but both are unrealistic. Trying to understand teenagers in this way won't work. The movie's moral also cannot be divorced from the context of the time. By the 1950s, ideas of morality and parenting had thankfully moved beyond the Oliver Twist principle. Nurture, rather than nature, was now considered to be the main reason for a child's troubled behaviour. However, the definition of good parenting was limited entirely to the ideal patriarchal family, which nowadays we would understand to be a very narrow and restrictive definition of a stable family. Therefore, judging the families in Rebel Without a Cause for being the cause of their children's rebellion is more than a little harsh. While Plato's parents clearly don't give a shit about their son, the same can't be said for Jim's family. The only reason why Jim's father is so condemned in the movie's narrative is because he doesn't fit the 1950s ideal of a good father. He's not abusive or neglectful, nor does he have unreasonable expectations of his son. Instead, he supports him and wants to help him work through his problems, only to be rebuffed. Well, we've, we've got to consider all the 
pros and cons. Well, uh, we don't have time. We'll make time. I'll get some paper and we'll make a list. A and then if we're still stuck, we'll, we'll get some advice. While the 1950s might call Mr. Stark a bad father, his only crime is the fact that he's too caring and too nurturing to fit the era's idea of masculinity. God, how horrible. His son is probably just having a bad time, as, well, what teenager doesn't? He's just moved to a new school, and his body's being overrun by weird chemical combinations, and now he's worried that people might think he's gay. Is that meaning me? Is that meaning me? What? A chicken. Yes. That's plenty enough reason to be a moody and irritable little bastard. Maybe, in this case, it's no one's fault, and Mr. Stark is just doing the best he possibly can, which is actually pretty fucking good. However, even though this movie is theoretically flawed, has a confusing time frame, and presents an outdated view of teenage problems, Rebel Without a Cause is, in its own way, a wonderful and important piece of cinema. Despite the general melodramatic tone of the movie, and the performances, the chemistry between the leads is wonderful, whether because of the acting prowess of James Dean, or because of the reality of Salmoneo's feelings for him. Nicholas Ray's direction also deserves a mention. There's a vibrant use of colour throughout the film, and the film's excellent cinematography makes Rebel Without a Cause a treat to look at, if nothing else. As a queer film, it's certainly not the paradigm of enlightened acceptance, but the inclusion of a coded gay supporting character, who was accepted and understood by his friends, was certainly a rare thing at the time. Jim is in no way upset or repulsed by Plato's attentions, and doesn't seem entirely uninterested himself. The film's trio is clearly meant to represent an ideal heterosexual family with a father, a mother and a child, but could also be understood as a polyamorous relationship as well. There's a real sense of love between the three, a bond far stronger than you'd expect from simply one day. The fact that queer people were involved in the production of this film probably helped to create at very least a sympathetic and level-headed portrayal. Strangely enough, Plato isn't really supposed to be crazy or psychotic, even though there is clear indication that he has some serious mental instabilities, but none of these are linked to his homosexuality. His love for Jim, whether as a father figure or a possible romantic partner, doesn't make him crazy, even if it does apparently mean that he can't fit into the proper heterosexual narrative. I can only imagine what this character must have meant to queer teenagers watching the film at the time, for here, finally, was someone who was just like them who felt just as confused and alone as they did. Too bad about the whole dying at the end thing, though. Oh well, it was the 50s, and they did just about the best they could. This poor baby got nobody. Just nobody. So that was Rebel Without a Cause, a film well worth watching, just as long as you remember that it is in no way a treatise on how you should live your life or treat your teenagers or parents. If he had guts to knock Mom cold once, then maybe she'd be happy and then she'd stop picking on him. For a film of the time period, it does a great job of humanising the characters and understanding their concerns. And that, as well as James Dean's performance, is one of the reasons it's endured so long. And now, if you'll excuse me, I've got to go. I've got a chicken race to get to. You know, parents are the same no matter time no place. They don't understand that us kids are going to make some mistakes. So to you other kids all across the land, there's no need to argue. Parents just don't understand. 